Hi guys, Dane here, and today I'm going to be doing a review of Prey by Michael Crichton, uh, the number one bestseller. As always, I'm just going to read the blurb, then I'm going to go through and check out some of my tabs, and then I'll share my overall thoughts and rating at the end. So, Dane reads... In California, odd things are happening to unemployed scientist Jack Foreman. His children tell Jack that strange men have visited the house, and Julia, his wife, isn't helping. She acts, even looks, somehow different. Deep in the Nevada desert, in the laboratory where Julia works, matters are out of control. A swarm of rogue microbots, designed to reproduce and learn, is developing with a frightening speed that has the scientists battling to contain it. Only when Jack is called in to help does he discover the shocking truth. The microbots have been programmed to behave as predators and man is the prey. Um, so it does actually start out almost a bit like more of like a domestic intrigue novel because he suspects his wife is cheating on him and it's only until we get kind of later in the series that we really understand what's happening. I want to read you out here uh, his author bio because this is quite a badass author bio. Michael Crichton is the author of The Andromeda Strain, Congo, Jurassic Park, Rising Sun, Disclosure, The Lost World and State of Fear. He has sold more than 150 million books and his books have been translated into 36 languages and 13 have been made into films. He is also the creator of the television series ER. He is the only person to have had at the same time the number one book, movie and TV show in the United States. That's quite the accolade, isn't it? And we have an introduction here called Artificial Evolution in the 21st Century, and this is like a non-fiction introduction where Crichton talks about some of the concepts that he covers in the book. He says, the notion that the world around us is continuously evolving is a platitude. We rarely grasp its full implications. We do not ordinarily think, for example, of an epidemic disease changing its character as the epidemic spreads. Nor do we think of evolution in plants and animals as occurring in a matter of days or weeks, though it does. And we do not ordinarily imagine the green world around us as a scene of constant sophisticated chemical warfare, with plants producing pesticides in response to attack, and insects developing resistance. But that is what happens too. And he says that, but obviously we do think of an epidemic disease changing its character as the epidemic spreads, because we live in the middle of the COVID-19 pandemic. I wonder what, what he would have made of that. And I like the way this, this starts, because... Basically, there's kind of an old rule in writing that you sort of set the daily routine and then you, from there you can then break it and get into the story. And um, this is like, <laughs> it's the most boring beginning to a book ever, If it's, but in a nice way. It's just very mundane, you know? Things never turn out the way you think they will. I never intended to become a house husband, stay-at-home husband, full-time dad, whatever you want to call it. There is no good term for it. But that's what I'd become in the last six months. Now I was in Crate and Barrel in downtown San Jose picking up some extra glasses, and while I was there I noticed they had a good selection of placemats. We needed more placemat. The woven oval ones that Julia had bought a year ago were getting pretty worn and the weave was crusted with baby food. The trouble was they were woven so you couldn't wash them. So I stopped at the display to see if they had any placemats that might be good and I found some pale blue ones that were nice and I got some white napkins. And then some yellow placemats caught my eye because they looked really bright and appealing so I got those too. They didn't have six on the shelf and I thought we'd better have six so I asked the sales girl to look in the back to see if they had more. While she was gone I put the placemat on the table and put a white dish on it and then I put a yellow napkin next to it. The setting looked very cheerful and I began to think maybe I should get eight instead of six. That was when my cell phone rang and then that's when we sort of start to get into the story. And this little paragraph was interesting. Um, this was with, uh, who's, what's it, with his colleague, uh, former colleague. This is with his former colleague Ricky. Um, and there may be something weird going on there as well. But anyway, the conversation was coming to an end and I felt filled with tension. The kind of awkward tension when you think another guy knows something and isn't telling you. Because he's embarrassed, because he doesn't know how to put it, because he doesn't want to get involved, because it's too dangerous even to mention, because he thinks it's your job to figure it out for yourself. Especially when it's something about your wife, like she's screwing around. He's looking at you like you're the walking wounded. It's night of the living dead, but he won't tell you. In my experience, guys never tell other guys when they know something about their wives. But women always tell other women if they know of a husband's infidelity. And then Julia goes a bit mental at him because basically she's working all the time and he's looking after the kids. And so whenever the kids have a problem, he sort of sorts it. And she goes, you're so controlling. And it's like, no, he just knows how to look after your kids, love. And then he's having a coffee with somebody and she flicked her burning cigarette into the remains of my latte. Now, as far as I'm aware, he hadn't actually finished his latte. And uh, I believe this is true as well, but I just like the way this was put. Uh, she stared at me, appraising. You're depressed. I'm not. You should have some of this tea, she said. All that coffee is bad for your nerves. Tea has more caffeine than coffee. They get a reference to calling Julia. And he goes, she's in the car. She has a car phone. Call her. Wow, do you remember the days of car phones? I don't. I've never seen one in real life. But I remember pre-mobile phone. It's just car phones were super uncommon, I guess. In the UK, they were. 
And so anyway, he ends up going out to the desert to work at their facility there, and um, he gets told, cars have to be under shade here, or the dashboards buckle. Get a first degree burn if you touch your steering wheel. Imagine it being that hot. So anyway, he goes inside and Vince is giving him the tour and Vince points at some signs saying, warning, lethal electrical currents. And he says, take those warnings seriously. We had problems with fires a while back. Oh? Yeah, got a nest of rats in the building. Burgers kept getting fried, literally. I hate the smell of burning rat fur, don't you? Never had that experience, I said. Smells like what you'd think. Uh-huh, I said. How did the rats get him? Up through the toilet bowl. I must have looked surprised because Vince said, oh, you don't know that. Rats see that all the time. It's just a short swim for them to get in. Of course, if it happened while you were sitting, it'd be a nasty surprise. So we learn about Rosie, and um, she's, she's a great character. Just the kind of character I like, she's nerdy. Rosie Castro was dark, thin, exotic looking, and sarcastic. She wore baggy cargo shorts and a t-shirt tight across her large breasts, which read, you wish. Independent and rebellious, Rosie had been a Shakespearean scholar at Harvard before she decided, in her words, that Shakespeare is fucking dead for fucking centuries. There is nothing new to say. What's the point? She transferred to MIT, became a protege of Robert Kim, worked on natural language programming. It turned out she was brilliant at it. And these days, natural language programs are starting to involve distributed processing because it turned out people evaluate a sentence in several ways simultaneously while it is being spoken. They don't wait until it's finished, but rather they form expectations of what is coming. That's a perfect situation for distributed processing, which can work on a problem at several points simultaneously. And uh, yeah, natural language processing is one of the technologies I write about quite a lot um, in my freelance writing for clients. This is really cool as well. So it says, in 1990, some IBM researchers pushed xenon atoms around on a nickel plate until they formed the letters IBM in the shape of the company logo. The entire logo was one ten billionth of an inch long and could only be seen through an electron microscope. But it made a striking visual and it got a lot of publicity. IBM allowed people to think it was a proof of concept, the opening of a door to molecular manufacturing but it was more of a stunt than anything else. We get a reference to the old joke, Turtles All The Way Down, which is where John Green got his title from for his novel, and where the idea of the Discworld came from as well. Um, you can look it up, I'm not gonna go into the full story here. And here we learn about one of the reasons why this virus is accelerating so quickly, um, but it also relates back to human evolution. I just thought it was fascinating. Um, so let's see, start back up here. You can see that exact speed up in the evolution of life on Earth. The first life shows up four billion years ago as single cell creatures. Nothing changes for the next two billion years. Then nuclei appear in the cells. Things start to pick up. Only a few hundred million years later, multicellular organisms. A few hundred million after that, explosive diversity of life and more diversity. By a couple of hundred million years ago, there are large plants and animals, complex creatures, dinosaurs. In all this, man's a latecomer. Four million years ago, upright apes. Two million years ago, early human ancestors. 35,000 years ago, cave paintings. The acceleration was dramatic. If you compress the history of life on Earth into 24 hours, then multicellular organisms appeared in the last 12 hours, dinosaurs in the last hour, the earliest men in the last 40 seconds, and modern men less than one second ago. It had taken two billion years for primitive cells to incorporate a nuclear, the first step towards complexity. But it had taken only 200 million years, one tenth of the time, to evolve multicellular animals. And it took only four million years to go from small brained apes with crude bone tools to modern man and genetic engineering. That was how fast the pace had increased. This same pattern showed up in the behavior of agent based systems. It took a long time for agents to lay the groundwork and to accomplish the early stuff. But once that was completed, subsequent progress could be swift. There was no way to skip the groundwork, just as there was no way for a human being to skip childhood. You had to do the preliminary work. But at the same time, there was no way to avoid the subsequent acceleration. It was, so to speak, built into the system. And uh, this is interesting, again, some more stuff based on real science. Um, so, animals like zebras and caribou didn't live in herds because they were sociable. Herding was a defense against predation. Large numbers of animals provided increased vigilance, and attacking predators were often confused when the herd fled in all directions. Sometimes they literally stopped cold, show a predator too many targets, and it often chased none. The same thing was true of flocking birds and schooling fish. Those coordinated group movements made it harder for predators to pick out a single individual. Predators were drawn to attack an animal that was distinctive in some way. That was one reason why they attacked infants so often. Not only because they were easier prey, but because they looked different. In the same way, predators killed more males than females because non-dominant males tended to hang on the outskirts of the herd where they were more noticeable. In fact, 30 years ago, when Hans Crook studied hyenas in the Serengeti, he found that putting paint on an animal guaranteed it would be killed in the next attack. 
That was the power of difference. So I thought this was interesting. Um, he goes, if you want to think of it that way, a human being is actually a giant swarm, or more precisely, it's a swarm of swarms because each organ, blood, liver, kidneys, is a separate swarm. What we refer to as a body is really the combination of all these organ swarms. We think our bodies are solid, but that's only because we can't see what is going on at the cellular level. If you could enlarge the human body, blow it up to a vast size, you would see that it was literally nothing but a swirling mass of cells and atoms, clustered together into smaller swirls of cells and atoms. Is blood an organ? I don't think blood is an organ. The skin's an organ, isn't it? This line here, I found a bit confusing. So he looks, I looked over at the workstation monitor. It said 4.55 a.m. I closed my eyes and lay there for a while, but I couldn't go back to sleep. I was wet and uncomfortable. I decided to take a shower. Shortly before 5 in the morning, I got out of bed. Now, isn't 4.55 a.m. already shortly before 5 in the morning? So when he says he lay there for a while, he, less, he lay there for less than five minutes. So I wouldn't say that's a while. Anyway, it ends as well with um, the swarm actually solved the problem they had set for it. But then it kept going, kept evolving, and they let it. They didn't understand what they were doing. I'm afraid that will be on the tombstone of the human race. I hope it's not. We might get lucky. So I think it was quite a powerful ending. But yeah, overall, Prey by Michael Crichton. It was pretty good. Um, I think it could have been shorter. Um, weirdly, I was kind of more invested in the beginning when it was more of this like family drama. And then once we actually get to the bits with the swarm of these nanobots, I lost interest a little bit. Um, it almost felt as though it was trying too hard in some ways. But I mean, it's still it's a pretty good thriller. The uh, technology hold, holds up pretty well in it as well, especially compared to some of Crichton's other books. So overall, I would give it like a middle of the road 3.5 out of 5. So there we have it. That's what I made of Prey by Michael Crichton. As always, don't forget to let me know in the comments what you thought of this book. If you read it, hit that like button if you've enjoyed this video. Hit that subscribe button for more. And I will see you soon for another bookish video. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye.